This is the Week in Sustainability from Workiva Carbon, formerly Sustain Life. It's where our team of experts and practitioners share weekly insights and commentary to keep you up to date about all things sustainability. Hi, and welcome back to the Week in Sustainability. Today, we are going to be diving in on a couple of hard hitting reports that set the stage for COP29, which is coming up in less than two weeks in Baku, Azerbaijan. Thank you, Sean, for joining me. Hello, hello. So COP29, it's being billed as the finance COP. And honestly, it couldn't come at a more pivotal moment. Today, we're unpacking two big reports that really highlight where we stand and the change still needed to sidestep the worst climate impacts. So let's kick things off with the nationally determined contributions or NDCs. <laughs> for new listeners, NDCs are essentially the emissions reductions pledges that countries make every five years. And the big issue here is that according to the UN's latest data, even if every country were to hit their current NDC target, which most countries are not on, on projected target to hit, we would still only see a 2.6% drop in global emissions by 2030. Yeah, and this is hugely worrying, of course. Scientists tell us that emissions need to drop by 43% by 2030 to save off the worst impacts of climate change. So the gap between 2.6% that we might not even reach and 43% that we need is depressingly massive and shows just how much more ambition is needed in these commitments. Yeah, exactly. And, and these were the targets that were supposed to be ambitious in the first place. So Simon Steele, who heads the UN framework convention on climate change, essentially says that these current plans are falling miles short of what's needed. And he's calling on countries to go back to the drawing board, rethink, and bring much stronger pledges to COP29. And this summit isn't just about 2025 goals anymore. It's about getting serious about 2030 and 2035. Absolutely. And what's interesting here is we're seeing a sort of climate bargaining dynamic. Pablo Vieira from the NDC Partnership mentioned that some countries are beginning to use their climate pledges as leverage, saying, sure, we'll aim higher on emissions cuts, but we need additional funding to get there. With this being the finance COP, the main agenda item is to set what's called a new collective quantified goal for climate finance. This will replace the current $100 billion of annual uh, spend target that developed countries pledged back in 2009 initially at the COP in Copenhagen. And after finally hitting that target two years ago, albeit two years behind schedule, the conversations now are aiming for potentially trillions of spend per year. And it's it's amazing to see that we hit that goal, even if we hit it late. And I think it's also the telling of the, the size of the problem in front of us that the number of dollars needed for solutions just continues to balloon. And there's still so much to figure out. So the total size of this financial target, which seems to be moving, um, and then also, will there be multiple multiple types of targets for multiple types of climate finance, which countries are going to contribute? Then we need to decide on the instruments to use, so grants versus loans, and the impact of these decisions will shape the world of global climate finance starting starting now and starting in 2025. And in addition to this, there's also loss and damage. So after the historic creation of the loss and damage fund two years ago at COP27, this year's COP will be focusing on operationalizing and scaling up financial support for it. The World Bank is set to host the fund for at least four years and already over $700 million has been pledged by countries so far, mainly by France, Germany, and the UAE though. Interestingly, the U.S. has only committed 11 of those $700 million, and countries like China, India, and Russia that are huge emitters themselves haven't committed anything at all. Yeah, this funding imbalance is just a mirror to the existing web of geopolitical tensions that impact topics beyond climate. You know, the, the U.S. and China have had a strained relationship for many, many years, but they've expressed an interest in you know, sidestepping those issues to dedicate themselves to collaborating on climate issues. The same is not true of the relationship between US and Russia. Uh, and India is really outspoken appropriately about the responsibility of historic emitters like the US. We've reaped the benefits of industrialization. We should be leading on aggressive climate action. Exactly. And these tensions, of course, make cooperation tougher. 
And with 2024 being a triple COP year that has not only a climate COP, but also currently uh, a biodiversity COP and in December at a certification conference, there's a big push to connect the dots between these different environmental issues and to come up with an approach that is uh, wider and all encompassing. But such an approach that could be more effective also requires much more collaboration and at a level that really, unfortunately, isn't being displayed much of lately. Yeah, exactly. And, and not to get too into the weeds of the sort of the scientific text, but the global climate science community predicted this element of the problem as well. In this most recent IPCC report, or AR6, they adopted previous modeling strategies known as the shared socioeconomic pathways. They account for the ways that these political differences and dynamics play out and hinder or help our ability to solve climate problems. In our current world, it shares a lot with SSP 3, 4, and 5, which are the pathways in which countries can't get over their sort of national competition priorities in order to solve growing environmental concerns. And, you know, should this hesitation for meaningful collaboration and compromise continue, we blow right past our emissions thresholds, which connects really well to the second report published in time for COP29. So the World Meteorological Organization, they publish an annual bulletin on atmospheric concentrations of CO2. And the news isn't good, unsurprisingly. You know, last year, we hit a record of 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, for context, the pre-industrial concentration was sitting around 280. Um, and then right at the beginning of this century, about 24 years ago, we were at 370. These levels are unprecedented. And the last time CO2 concentrations were this high in the atmosphere, humans weren't around. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, and it's terrifying for sure. Exactly. And that brings us back to the importance of updating NDCs. Under the Paris Agreement, governments must set their climate targets, as you said, every five years. And at COP29, which is just leading up to the 2025 deadline for new targets, we're going to see updated 2030 targets, new 2035 targets, and associated actions for just transitions, as well as adaptation and uh, loss and damage. Major emitters like the US, China, India that we've discussed, which account for interesting 43% of all global emissions, just those three countries, will really be under the spotlight to be more ambitious. For contrast, the bottom 100 countries um, in terms of largest emitters represent less than 3% of global emissions. Wow. Yeah, those those numbers tell, they really condense like such a complex story into just a few numbers. But, you know, in 2021, the U.S. had an emissions intensity of 17 tons of CO2 per capita. China had the statistic of nine tons of CO2 per capita, and then India sat at two. And when we have this tendency to think that we can't transition without taking some kind of economic sacrifice, but the U.S. has had years in which emissions decrease while GDP grows. There are many economic examples that show that transitioning is economically advantageous, so we know it's possible to decouple growth from fossil fuel dependence. It's just a reminder that there's a, a delicate balancing act involved here. No doubt. And while all of this can feel overwhelming, we all, of course, have a role to play, whether it's staying up to date on these latest developments, having honest conversations with our friends and families leading up to these uh, COPs on the roles and responsibilities that we and our government share with respect to climate mitigation. And then there's also, of course, always opportunities to vote with your uh, in your ballot, vote with your wallet, and advocate always for strong climate policies that get us where we need to get. Um, I feel like it's an all hands on deck moment it probably has been for a while and will continue to be, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah, absolutely. The The takeaway from these reports is crystal clear. We're not moving fast enough and the need for a massive investment is only growing. Uh, we'll be watching COP29 closely and as always, we'll be bringing you the latest insights as critical decisions unfold. With that, thanks for tuning in, everyone. See you next time on The Week in Sustainability. Workiva Carbon provides organizations with an easy-to-use solution to manage the full life cycle of measuring, managing, and reporting carbon emissions. 
now integrated into the same platform used to manage the world's most trusted financial and non-financial reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this show on our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. See you next week.